we are now in the process of defeating the radical left, the Marxists, the anarchists, the agitators, the looters, and people who, in many instances, have absolutely no clue what they are doing. That is why we pay tribute to generations of American heroes whose names have etched on our monuments and memorials and in the pages of history and in the hearts of a very grateful people. We will never allow an angry mob to tear down our statues, erase our history, indoctrinate our children, or trample on our freedoms. In every age, there have always been those who seek to lie about the past in order to gain power in the present. Those that are lying about our history, those who want us to be ashamed of who we are, are not interested in justice or in healing. Their goal is demolition. Our goal is not to destroy the greatest structure on Earth, what we have built. Our country was founded on an idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. We've never lived up to it. Jefferson himself didn't. He held slaves. Women were excluded. But once proposed, it was an idea that couldn't be constrained. It survived the ravages of the Civil War, the dogs of Bull Connor, the assassination of Martin Luther King, and more than 200 years of systemic racism. And just weeks ago, the murder of George Floyd. Through it all, these words have gnawed at our conscience and pulled us towards justice. American history is no fairy tale. It's been a constant push and pull between the two parts of our character. The idea that all men and women, all people are created equal, and the racism that has torn us apart. We have a chance now to give the marginalized, the demonized, the isolated, the oppressed a full share of the American dream. We have a chance to rip the roots of systemic racism out of this country. We have a chance to live up to the words that have founded this nation. This Independence Day, Let's not just celebrate the words. Let's celebrate that promise. Commit to work. The work we must do to fulfill that promise. Remain locked in the battle for the soul of this nation. But believe me, truly, it's a battle we can and we will win if we act together. Happy Fourth. Welcome back to Countdown to the White House. With us still, Frank Ayegogun in Lagos, Nigeria, and Rainer Jackson in Washington, United States of America, and Joe Cuomo in Douala, Cameroon. Um, Frank and Rainer, you saw the Republican candidate, President Donald Trump, and you saw the Democratic uh, candidate, party candidate, uh, Joe Biden. Uh, interesting and stark contrast on um, their messages to the United States, the 4th of July independence speech um, just a couple of days ago. Let me start with you, Frank. What are your impressions of what you had um, from both leaders? Um, characteristically, Trump is divisive, um, sees nothing good in others. Contrast that uh, with uh, Biden, who foresees the path of togetherness the path of hope rather than despair, the path of seeking solutions rather than going after imaginary enemies, the path of healing rather than destruction, but most importantly, the path of truth and honesty. Truth and honesty in acknowledging the wrong of the past honesty in seeking healing for that wrong, the difference is so clear between these two men who are conversing for the American votes. Reina, you're a, a lobbyist as well as a Republican uh, strategist. Um, I'm sure that you have your own thoughts about um, 
vote speeches. Um, Raynard Jackson. Yes, I, I find it amazing. Joe Biden has been in politics almost as long as I've been living. And let's look at his record. What has he substantively done when it comes to the black community? Well, back in the 70s, he said he didn't want his kids going. A, 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 I mean, um, uh, Robert Byrd, a, a, a leader of the uh, KKK here in the U.S., he supported uh, the segregation of students back in the 70s. He was the author and the major sponsor of the crime bill that Clinton passed in uh, the early 90s. And so when you look at Joe Biden's body of work when it comes to the black community, you cannot name me one substantive thing that's positive that Joe Biden has done relative to the black community. Now, let's, let's, let's compare that with Donald Trump. And isn't it amazing in the 90s and early 2000s, everybody in hip hop, Puff Daddy, Biggie Smalls, Russell Simmons, all these stars in Hollywood, black, they all wanted to hang out at Trump's hotel in Atlantic City. They all wanted to take pictures with him. They all wanted to do business with Trump. Now, isn't it amazing also in, in West Palm Beach, where Trump's private club is Mar-a-Lago, in, in 1990, Trump filed two lawsuits. There were two law, there were two private clubs in Palm Beach, Florida, one of the wealthiest places in the U.S. They wouldn't allow Jews and blacks to become members of their club. Trump unilaterally filed two lawsuits and won both cases, and those clubs to this day uh, admit blacks and Jews. So this whole notion that, that, that Biden has done a lot in the black community with, is not true, Compare that with the tangible, substantive thing that Donald Trump has done, I just find that amazing. So, so when, you, when you gauge the moment in the United States, you see the protests happening across major cities, and the opportunity to address the United States on the 4th of July, which is one of the most important day, days in the United States, and you hear Donald Trump talk about fascists, talk about communists, and those who want to uh, tear down the very fabric of the United States, and then you hear Joe Biden say, now's the time to unite and bring together. Which would you say will appeal to people to calm the nerves down and look the terror in the face and say, let's fix this? Well, it depends on who you're talking to, but the Black Lives Matter, Donald Trump rightly called a fascist group. If you go to their own website, they say in their own words, their goal is to, to destroy the nuclear family, to promote homosexuality, to get rid of capitalism. That is their own words. So you tell me in America how those policies work. And if you want to look at all the, the, the problems in the black community, they can all be laid at the foot of our destruction of the black family. When you took, take the male out of the home, which we've done in the U.S., you create all these problems because a woman cannot teach a boy how to be a man no more than a man can teach a, 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 a take a girl and teach her how to be a woman and so um black lives matter on their own website in their own words said their job is to destroy america and create a fascist state and that's what they're attempting to do um, Frank, Frank Aibogun, we've seen this protest not just uh, localized in the United States, but spread to a faraway Johannesburg in South Africa, Accra and Ghana. Even in Nigeria, the Lagos State House of Assembly did have a debate a uh, couple, uh, I think it was last week, uh, talking about what to do with monuments, uh, for example, or streets which have been named uh, against um, so-called controversial colonial uh, masters, you know, back some centuries ago and whether or not uh, to take it out. It was an interesting debate. I, we have all followed. But Donald Trump talks about those pulling down monuments in the United States will face um, the wrath of the law, sort of criminalizing the act. Does this in any way assuage um, and impact black sentiment in a way that they can turn down those protests, or does it further infuriate them? I don't, I don't think it matters to Donald Trump how the blacks, you know, uh, what they hear him and how they hear what they hear from him. 
remember that is Donald Trump who said at the beginning of his riots that uh, when the blacks start to go out to riot, then the body bags will start coming back home, uh, that the guns will follow. Um, so it's not surprising at all that Donald Trump is unwilling um, to demonstrate the honesty and humility that you would expect of a leader. Um, truth is, all over the world, uh, people are speaking with one voice. That uh, Floyd was by a white policeman. And that it is not the first time and that there is indeed a link between being black and losing your life under the knee of a policeman. Trump has never acknowledged that there is systematic uh, uh, racism in the, in, in the police in America. Trump has never acknowledged that the statutes that you refer to, that some of them tend to glorify the ugly past of America. Um, and the world um, outside of America, uh, thank God, Trump is not a ruler of the whole world. But the world outside of America is speaking with one voice and saying to the blacks, we are with you. You see what's happening in the UK at the beginning of every match today, the players take their knees just to um, demonstrate their solidarity uh, with um, what's happening in America. So um, I think it is clear um, that the world feels differently from the way Trump feels. Um, and thank goodness that we can, we can express uh, our views on this. I totally disagree with you, Frank. I think more the world agrees with people like me and Trump simply because we cannot have people going around trying to rewrite history and pretend like it didn't exist. So what I've advocated in the U.S. is as opposed to pulling down the statue, let's add a statue. So Robert E. Lee, who fought for the Confederacy back in the U.S., as opposed to tearing down his statue, let's put a picture, uh, a statue of Martin Luther King next to him, and let's tell both sides of the story. Let's tell the whole picture. So as opposed to taking down another statue, let's put a, a statue next to it of Malcolm X. And, and so we have to stop trying to pretend certain things in history did not happen. And where I criticize my white compatriots in the U.S. is tell the whole story of American history. A lot of uh, conservative whites will ask me during February, well, Jackson, why do you all need to have a Black History Month? Well, because you all, meaning white folks, you all would not tell the history that blacks played in the development of American history outside of slavery. So if you all were to tell the whole story, guess what? we wouldn't need Black History Month. And so until you all are willing to tell the whole story, we're going to continue to have Black History Month. But the the issue is not subtraction and taking down statues, but it's addition, adding statues. I think that's the solution worldwide. Hmm. Well, I, uh, my, uh, my, my view my view so, is that so it's, Rena, uh, it's in the, posi um, something it's in the for position us to of also Trump dwell. to lead okay. conversation around that. Hmm. Uh, and, and to bring people together around a consensus in terms of how to go forward. He hasn't done that so far. Hmm. Let's, let's say it's a rolling conversation. But, but tell me something, Reina. Together with um, what is going on with race relations, uh, the impact of coronavirus also is heavily in the minds of several people in the United States, especially among the black community who fear that the impact of the coronavirus on their access to health care as well as their jobs is higher than you have with the whites and Hispanics. Um, they fear a quick reopening, contrary to what Donald Trump wants, and you've seen the consequence of the reopening in several states uh, where there's been a second wave of the virus hitting them uh, for this sort of hasty decision. But the unemployment rate among the blacks in the United States is way higher than national average at 16%. What would you say in terms of how to navigate these waters between the rock and the hat place uh, for the African community who uh, don't want a quick reopening, but those numbers of unemployed blacks continues to skyrocket. Reynard. Yeah, well, 
that's always been a disparity between the black unemployment and the white unemployment, Hispanic. And that that's no new thing. And it, you know, when you have a a crisis, a pandemic like we have now, those who are at the bottom of the economy are going to be disproportionately negatively impacted. So I don't think that's a surprise either. What I have told the White House, and uh, you know, two weeks ago, I met with the president about these very issues. And what I told him was, I think the solution is is to bring together more black healthcare professionals and let's look at the the health issues that are unique to the black community and let's come up with some targeted solution based on what these black health professionals say, number one. Number two, as far as the, the economic issue, is I think we need to have targeted uh, 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 solutions from the Treasury Department and our Commerce Department specifically targeting black entrepreneurs and finding creative ways to get them more money to sustain them during this downturn in business. Because guess what? Uh, these black entrepreneurs who are a key economic engine to our economy, we need to have access to capital not only to get us through the pandemic but even in in good time we've always suffered from a major lack of uh, credit and and, and access to capital and uh, so i've been engaged on a very high level with the white house to to come up with some substantive program that's going to infuse the black community with access to capital and that's something we should have done probably i'm hoping by next month Mm. Mm. Uh, let, let, let me speak with Frank on this one, even though I know that um, Ray, uh, Raynard will have something to say about this general school of thought in terms of political strategies. When you have an incumbent running for a second term, it's considered to be a referendum on what he's been able to do um, with the economy, race relations, the coronavirus pandemic in this um, instance. Um, does this do the United States a disservice in not being able to interrogate Joe Biden's plan uh, for the United States uh, compared to what Donald Trump is doing, either correctly or absolutely awful, uh, Frank? Um, I am not exactly sure that is the case. Um, Biden was uh, vice president for eight years uh, to um, President Obama. And I believe a lot of his views are out there uh, in the public domain. Um, his life is essentially up there in the public domain. And since he began to run for um, the candidacy of the Democratic Party for the November election, I think Joe Biden has made um, a good job of, 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 you know, better positioning the Democratic Party. Um, Will this be a vote around how well Donald Trump has performed? I think largely yes. Um, and I think that is being shaped by both the health pandemic and of course the economic paralysis that flowed from them. Um, and, and my sense is that President Trump is struggling um, to ensure that he's not defined by what is happening in relation to the pandemic in America. Yesterday, America crossed another green milestone of 3 million infections in America, more than 130,000 deaths in America. But beyond that, um, the leadership that is expected, um, that people cry for, that they yearn for, they are waiting for the president to, um, to demonstrate that leadership. He will not wear a face mask. He will not recommend that people wear face masks. He sees a quick reopening of the economy as a way you know, to get back to the debate around the state of the economy. 
uh, I believe that there has to be a measured way to reopen the economy without, you know, putting people's lives in greater danger. We see what has happened in most of Europe, um, how very deliberate they have gone about it. We see what is happening across the border in Canada. Um, and I think there is indeed a lot um, that we can we can learn if we choose uh, to be humble. Hmm. Reina, it's it's um, Donald Trump's call. You know, either way you look at it, your political strategist. It was um, Dwight Eisenhower. He had the plaque on the table which says, "The box stops here." And uh, people are going to judge Donald Trump exactly how he's handled it. You know, well, what are your thoughts? A, a referendum on Trump's handling no, of, I, of the situation in the United no, States. No, I agree. Not... I agree, one hundred percent. Some Democrats. Uh, to my amazement, are trying to say Donald Trump is responsible for the virus that everyone knows that's not even true. The American people are going to judge Trump on how he manages this pandemic. That's what he's going to be judged on. And if he is viewed as handling this pandemic in a proper manner and people feel secure and safe, He'll win re-election without question, and we, and no one's going to hold him accountable for the economy once the crisis hit. Again, they're looking at for leadership. They're looking for someone who can reassure them that everything is going to be okay. And I think there's room for improvement for Trump. On that note, he is not very good at at reassuring people. He's very bombastic and very in, in your face. And when you're hurting, when you're going through a crisis, it's almost like when you were a little kid, you did something wrong and, and, and your, your, your parents punish you. Well, you don't need a lecture from your parents. And you know you are guilty of violating your parents' rule. Uh, you need to take your punishment. Then you need your parents to come and hug you and say, uh, you know, I love you, boy, but you know, I told you not to go downstairs and, and break that window, but you broke the window. Now you got to be punished. That's what the president needs to do. He needs to reassure the American people that, hey, I have this crisis under control. I I want you to be assured and I want you to feel safe in, in going to a restaurant. I want you to feel safe and sending your kids back to school. I want you to feel safe going back to your job. That's where he's got to become better. And if he, let me tell you something. There is nothing Joe Biden and the Democrats are offering the American people that's going to make them win in November. As I tell media here in the U.S., the Democrats can't win in November, but Trump can lose. And. The election, in my view, is Trump's to lose. And uh, again, the American people are not buying what the Democrats and Joe Biden are selling as far as policy. If you elect Joe Biden come November, America will be a socialist country within three months. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll, we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Reina Jackson, uh, as well as Frank Aigwogun. Uh, Reina, maybe he comes to Nigeria <laughs> next time. We can uh, throw him a hot dish of pepper soup and then <laughs> yes, get his thoughts yes, yes. on that. And Frank, and I, I'm going to come to Lagos to visit you too. Cause Frank, I, 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 I look forward to you coming. <laughs> All right. Thank you very but much. But you got to um, be kind to me. You got to be kind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Frank Aigwagun, uh, CEO of Business Day, uh, Rainer Jackson, a Republican political consultant as well as lobbyist. It's been great having you. Countdown to the White House. Thank you. All right. Um, we apologize. Uh, Angel Cuema wasn't able to um, finish up with us, but she'll be with us next week. And uh, from Douala, Cameroon, together, we'll take you through the countdown to the White House. We thank our guests once more, uh, Frank Aigwagun and Rainer Jackson. Thank you also for watching. You can watch previous episodes of Countdown to the White House on our YouTube channel. Tweet at us at Silver News 24. I'm Aogo Obo. Bye-bye.